but we received a call about 4.45 this morning that Brother Carlos had passed away. So we're all mourning this morning. So it seems amazingly the call of God. Also, Tracy Hodge lost her father, or actually her stepfather, Friday night. So, our God cares. And he's near. And he loves us. And he's not forsaken us. And I... And I'm just sad. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we love you and we praise the name of Jesus Christ. Because if it wasn't for him and his eternal love for us to come down and dwell in flesh and take on our sin and pay the price to be our atoning offering and to impute his righteousness to us who had none I would have no hope here this morning but because of him we have a hope here today we can boldly approach the throne room of grace we can ask for help in our time of need and Father, well, I pray that you will shower the Perez family with your love and mercy. You will wrap them up. And for Tracy, our sister who has lost a man dear to her as a father, I just pray your mercies on them. Father, we thank you so much that we have this privilege and this opportunity. I thank you that it's through the precious, perfect work of Christ that we have this access and that we now can have fellowship and be comforted in the midst of our struggles and our toils and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we will receive grace that is sufficient for us. I thank you for that, Lord. I ask now, Father, for you to speak for me because I don't know. I just need you to speak. Say the words you want said. Heal your people. Comfort them. Father, we, we love you and we thank you and we rejoice for our brother. We rejoice. He's in your presence. We rejoice for him. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reminded of something Carlos' dad told me when I first met him. He said, of course, his father, English was the second language for him. And he said to me, he said, do you speak Spanish? I said, no, sir. He said, you do not know how to speak the heavenly language. <laughs> I suspect Carlos is speaking the heavenly language. Amen. We're in the book of Malachi. Um, and we're going to walk through this. We're looking at this particular book, this particular time, with the kind of a context of looking at it as that Jacob and Esau. Esau being that first man, the firstborn, the old man, the Adam, and, or Esau, and then Jacob being the second man, the secondborn, the Christ. We talked a little bit about that two weeks ago when I was here. Josh filled in admirably, as always. Um, so I thank you for him for that. And as we walk through now, we're going to pick up in verse 6, and we're going to hopefully go down through verse 11. We will see what the Lord does here. But we saw last time that God's always angry with Esau. He's always tearing down the things Esau tries to build. He's always destroying the works of the flesh. He's always destroying the works of the old man. God's consistently and continually going to do that. But he's always building up the second man. He's always increasing the second man. And so as we look at this, we see now 
as he continues to deal, as God's continuing to deal with these folks who are about somewhere between 450 and 430 B.C., depending on how you want to date things, they have walked away from all the things that they had been given, and it's turned into something completely different. And God is dealing with them on this. He's not going to let it go, but this is the last time he speaks to them for 400 years. The next time he speaks in the scripture, we hear him in John the Baptist. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is what he says. And he's dealing with how people approach things, you know, how we go about what we do. He starts out with, in verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Now, Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, if I didn't say it. Please forgive me. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts. To you, priest, who despise my name, you, yet you say, In what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, In what way have we defiled you? By saying, The table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? I just want to stop there for a few moments and... and, and Go back up to the beginning of 6. That word honor, where it says a son honors his father, um, it's a different word, although it's associated with the word where it says when God asks, where is my honor? The first word when it's used here denotes a heavy burden, carrying a load, bringing something, toting something. It could be good or it could be bad. But that's what the first word means. And so God says to him, he says, a son honors his father. That means the son has a burden to do something for his father, to carry something for his father, to tote something, to make something known. And a servant has the same responsibility. He makes that known. It's a heavy burden, something he's supposed to carry, something he's supposed to do. And God is saying to us here, he's asking them, a son's supposed to honor his father. It's a command from Scripture. We know from Exodus chapter 20, this is what he was commanded to do. We go throughout Scripture, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. You can read here and you can go back and see what the requirements were. And by this time, they had started to shift that. So that by the time in Jesus' day, I could say, no, that's a gift for the church, so I don't have to do anything for my father. Same thing with a servant. We're told time and time again that a servant is supposed to honor his master, to give the master what he's due. And I think it's interesting that the two words separate, where is my honor? Because when he says, where is my honor, the specific meaning here is saying, where is your joy and happiness and contentment in carrying this burden? Why isn't this good for you? At 5 o'clock this morning, I thought about a passage of Scripture from Hebrews chapter 13 that I thought so perfectly described Carlos, and I posted it this morning if any of you see the Facebook post that I do. And it says, among other things, imitate those, the faith of those who are over you. It was always a joy for Carlos to do these things, wasn't it? See, he understood what that meant. I don't mean to eulogize him, but I will. He understood what that meant. Because the, the master here, the Lord Jesus Christ, is asking, where is my honor? Why do you not want to do this? Why is giving me honor such an issue for you? I'm entitled. I'm the father. 
by every stretch of the imagination, by every command from Scripture, by every thought or action, by every reason known, I'm entitled. So why, why am I not getting this? But more importantly, why don't you want to? Why is giving God honor such a drudgery? Why is it? I'm looking around the room today and it's so full and I'm rejoicing in that. But time and time again, coming down to give God honor and worship to Him and with His brethren can be such a work, such a burden almost. Almost like, wow, He's done. <laughs> That's exactly right. God forbid he go two minutes over 12. But that's, God is asking, why is this not an honor? He, 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 if you remember from our study in Nehemiah, we know what God has done for these folks. If you remember our study from Ezra, we know what God has done for these folks. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 5 and you read where he says, I have a vineyard and I, I planted a vineyard on a very fruitful hill and I put up a wall and I took out everything that should hurt and harm it and I put it in good soil and I used good seed. Why isn't it producing good fruit? And God, I'm going to graft in some other ones. Go back to Isaiah and read that. He wants to know, where is my honor? But if you are not joyful with this and you're not a son to honor him, then he's asking the same question, then I, if I'm a master. If you sit here today and you're... If you're here today and you genuinely are not living in an ongoing, loving continual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and a personal walk with Him so that it's a joy and a thanksgiving, so that your life is contentment and peace, even in the midst of the most tragic events we can have happen in a weekend of our church. We, are over, we overcome those by this grace and this mercy and this love that we have. And if you're not walking in that and you don't experience that, then where is the honor? Because He's as God, the Creator who has made you and I, and that alone makes him master. He's asking the question, if not because I'm the father, then why not because I'm the master? Amen. If it's not because of joy, then it's the other term that's being used. Why are you not doing this out of fear? Why are you not honoring me because of who I am? I read, I, I, I use this... Um, this American Patriot Bible sometimes, and it quotes, it quotes men from all since the founding of the country at various times. Listen to this prayer in May of 1775 by the Harvard College President Samuel Langdon, which, by the way, Harvard was founded on Christian principles. When it says, know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, Jesus Christ, when you go there now, all they have is know the truth. And I can define it any way I want in today's postmodern relative world. But this is 1775. He says, this is him praying for the Massachusetts Congress. He says, we have rebelled against God. We have lost the true spirit of Christianity, though we retain the outward profession and form of it. 1775. My brethren, let us repent and implore the divine mercy. May the Lord hear us this day in this day of trouble. We will rejoice in His salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. 1775. It was just as prevalent in 1775 as it is today just as it was the day Malachi wrote these words, just as the day these folks were living this existence. He wants to know, where is my reverence? The supreme, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-present God, the great I Am, the one who we are all just a few moments ago desperately calling out to to give us comfort in our loss and to be with Miss Diane and her family in their loss, which I can't imagine compared to even ours. He says, where is my reverence? says the Lord of hosts. But he goes further. He says, To you priests who despise my name, 
Now, we can certainly go to the Old Testament. We can time and time again, we can see how these priests, these men of God, these men who were, who were set apart to see to the service of the temple, to see that the offerings were brought in properly, that they were examined properly, that they were, that they were um, cut and bled properly and they could be offered properly that they go into the holy place and make sure that the bread was there and the, and the lampstand was burning and the oil was in place and all of these things. And then once a year, the high priest enter in for the holy of holies and to do the work of atonement there. These men were called to do that. And it's easy to look at these men now and go, yeah, them sorry guys, they should have been doing that. But I want to bring your attention to something that second, or First Peter tells us in chapter 2, verse 9. You are a holy priesthood. I'm a holy priesthood. And I was praying about this and thinking about this, and God forgive me if I've allowed any of this to happen in the 13 years that I've been here. But it's on all of us. It's on every one of us. To be the priest of God we've been commanded to be. And he's asking the question here. He's asking, to you priests who despise my name, because there's not a person in this room right now who would say, oh, I despise the Lord's name. You wouldn't none of us say that. We wouldn't say that. Because we'd actually, what do you mean? Isn't that what they said to Jesus? When did we not, when did we see you and not do these things? When did we see you and not clothe you? When did we see you and not feed you? When did we see you sick and in prison and not come to you? When did that happen? When you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, right? So it's easy to ask that question. They ask here now to the priest who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You have offered defiled food on my altar. Time and time in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, it's very plain. No leaven. There's an entire feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Passover includes no leaven in the bread because they had to leave that night to get away from what the death angel was about to do. And only the blood covering of Jesus Christ on that doorpost saved them. And he's asking that question. He said, you've offered defiled food on my altar. And I immediately was drawn to Mark chapter 8 where Jesus tells him, beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. See, because if we're not careful, we'll just simply read this and go, well, that's just talking about unleavened bread. I've got to make sure there's no leaven in it. That's the offering. I don't, I, we don't even do that now. And Jesus corrected them on their thinking. He said, no, it's the teaching. It's what you're carrying around. It's the culture of this age that we bring in to everything we say and do. You know, I did a, I'm doing a study, and I did a study on, um, the, there was a comparison in, uh, on the, a problem, a, uh, a settlement in 1775 that was done on Providence Island in, 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 in the islands. I don't remember the exact one now. I've got to go back and look at the paper. Compared that against the Massachusetts Bay Colony settlement. And the, the point of the study was, was how does culture impact a religious group or a church group or a people group? The people who were on Providence Island made the assumption that we'll all be fine right here and we'll all get along because we're sitting on an island in a closed space and nobody will be able to bother us. There won't be any cultural influence brought into our little island. We'll be fine. And then, of course, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and we know them, right? City set on a hill. We know about them. Guess what happened to the little Providence self-contained, isolated from the world, no cultural influence from outside. After three attempts at governments, they collapsed and the islands deserted. You know why? Because they brought the culture with them. They brought the leaven into the worship. It came from in here. That's what had to stay. You know what they did in Massachusetts when they got tired of each other and they said, I don't like your theology, you got to go? They just moved them over somewhere else. Instead of changing the culture to match the culture of Christ, we just moved the people out. I don't like what you say, so bye. When in fact what I should be doing is being conformed to the image of Christ. Because guys, we all got our culture that we were born and raised in. And I've come, I've come to realize that, you know, there's some things that are absolute uh, non-negotiables in that. And so that anywhere you go, anywhere in the world, if they're having church there and worshiping the true God, you ought to be able to find a place there. 
unless the culture is greater than the gospel. And you know what? Anybody from around the world ought to be able to come in here and find a place here as long as the gospel is greater than the culture. This is how we offer defiled bread on His altar. Because of what we bring in. That's what He's telling him here. You guys are still bringing in Esau, He's saying. You should be bringing the heart after Jacob, after Christ. He says, and they ask the question, in what way have we defiled you? By saying, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Boy, this is where well, we're getting to the meat of it now. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? When you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? And I thought, I've been thinking long and hard, how do I describe this? And then I thought about 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord's Supper. Where the scripture says they can't even wait for some other ones to get there. He says to him, don't you have homes to eat in and drink in? Don't you have places to do this? Is it so desperate now that you just consume and, and, and leave other people behind? As a matter of fact, you don't even examine yourself. And he says, this is why they're sick and dying among you. Because you don't check yourself. That's how we say the table's contemptible. Boy, you're all looking at me hard. And I don't mean to. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, uh, it's, it's just what the passage is. And one thing I know it's done to me this week is rip me up. Because how much of the culture do I bring in and just say, well, I just like that. That's just the way I like it. That's just the way I grew up. That's just what makes me feel good. Instead of going, what does the Lord want? How does the Lord want it done? Because I am always reminded it's going to be the way he wants. It's always going to be the way he wants. So he says, when you offer the blind, and I got to thinking about that, when, I do, when we do things for the Lord without consulting with the Lord, do you think that's a sense in operating in blindness? Am I making an offering in blindness when I don't take time to consult with the Lord about what I'm going to do next? doesn't matter how bold or how simple. That's a, that's a blind offering. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. It's culturally normal. I feel good about it. Worked last time. Let's do it again. God's always the same, but I've noticed there's a bunch of times He does a thing, those same things in a different way. You don't believe me? Go back. Start with Adam and work your way to Jesus. There's a whole bunch of guys listed there, and each one of them had a particular ministry and a particular action and a particular part of the overall narrative that is Jesus Christ. That's offering to, with blindness. Because I'm going to make offerings to God. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to ask God. I'm going to do these things. And I don't consider what God is saying and doing. I don't ask Him. I don't receive direction from Him. I'm doing that blind. And when the blind lead the blind, everybody's in a ditch. Everybody's in a ditch. He says, when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil, he says. It's not a question. It's, is it not evil? How many times have you gotten in trouble? You don't have to raise your hand because everybody would have their hands up. We'd look like a Pentecostal church. <laughs> that you got in trouble because you didn't ask God for something first. He says, and when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? You know, I thought about that lame. Now, there's, there's the colloquial version. Man, that's lame. But that's not it at all. Obviously, he's talking about unable to walk, unable to get up, unable to go. How often have I went in my own power, in my own strength, in my own way of thinking? And I wasn't going anywhere. It ends up being worse than when I started. I find myself just further behind. And that's certainly the sickness that entails all of us because this is what Esau brings to the table. My way, my sight, my actions, in my own strength, in my own power, the sickness of the sting of death. This is what we, he brings. And when I walk in him and I operate in him, this is an example of how my life starts to look. And God's going, where is my honor? 
Where is my reverence? But look further. Because this is what we do now. Because he says there, offer it then to your governor. Man, I, <laughs> never mind. I'm not even going to go into any of that. We just know our governor, governors, men in authority, the government. You know, let me just throw this one out. Let me just throw you this one. And I just go ahead and say this. If you don't tithe, we are not going to come look you up and throw you in jail. Amen. It's not going to happen. I don't know who ties. I don't know anything about it other than the men who've said, I tithe. That's as much as I know. But I guarantee you, if you don't pay that IRS next week, <laughs> they're going to be at the house with all the bullets that we can't buy anywhere right now. And that's, I know it's a silly illustration, but I think it makes the point. If our government's not playing with that. See, and we think because God's long-suffering and because God hadn't got on us or maybe done something quite yet, maybe, well, it must be all okay. I want you to know it's not. Because God's long-suffering is like the dam. Every day you look at the dam and you live in the valley and the dam looks great and wonderful and it's fine and the water's building up on the other side and it's building up on the other side and it appears to be fine. And one day when the dam finally breaks, the water's not going to stop until it's all run over the valley. Once it breaks, it's the full measure. Once God's long-suffering breaks, it's the full measure. And he tells us to let the judgment start at the house of God of which we are, if we are in Christ Jesus. And he says, would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? We've examined that. But now he puts in this, but here's what you say. Here's what we do, and here's what we got to be mindful of. But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? God's, he's pretty straightforward here. It's very plain. Where's my honor as a father? Where's my reverence as a master? Well, look what you've been doing to my table. Look how you come. Look how you worship. Look how you exalt God in every part of your life. Examine that. And then you're going to turn around and ask me for help? That's what he's saying. You know what? I know all of you, except for a few visitors who've just been visiting with us. And I can say this pretty with some assurance, that if God doesn't do anything else for us, we have gotten all the blessings we could have ever possibly stood or understand in this life. If you don't do another thing, and that's not how God works. Matter of fact, despite what I don't do, God still does. Despite my weaknesses, he is strong. Despite my frailties, he is great. Despite my sinfulness, he is sinless. And he has made atonement for me and for you. So that the man who does this, who has done these things, if he will go to the Lord Jesus Christ and seek him for mercy and keep on seeking Him until He shows that mercy. This ain't a one and done thing. This ain't like, well, okay, I know I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm done. I don't see that anywhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament. I see people constantly begging until God shows up. But a man who would do that, the man who will call on Him, the woman who will call on Him, and that's as far as I need to go because there ain't nobody else. Some of y'all get that on the way home. <laughs> Who will go to him despite the Esau in your life. He will receive you through the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can be received like Jacob was like everybody was 
who's ever repented and believed. That's the good news here. Why is this, you say? The, the other two verses. Who is there even among you whom would shut the door so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hand. See the quintessential problem that you and I have, that we think that I can bring to God something that He will receive and approve of in His temple, and you cannot. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do this. And Jesus said, I'm not going to accept you, but I'll accept Him. The Eternal One. My beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Scripture says, hear Him. That's who He's going to receive. Why? Because look at verse 11, and this is the reason. He says, From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Brother David likes to say, it, it, preach a sermon, and if you have to, talk. The whole world are to know how great our God is by the honor we give Him as our Father. No other reason. That alone should be sufficient for the world to know that He is our God and that He is good just by the honor that you and I give Him in our thoughts and actions. Let me ask you this one. and You don't have to raise your hands, but if, the, if your youngin gave you the honor you give God, what would happen to your youngin? Woo! Some days, right? Some days we're just like our youngins. Real good. Other... He's saying, from the rising of the sun, even to its going down. And we know enough about the scientific inquiry today that, that's, that there's no end to that. Sun's rising somewhere right now. Sun's going down somewhere right now. So God is saying, my, my glory is from that to that. There's no end to the honor you and I can bestow upon our Father. And you know the greatest way you can do this? I, I, I believe this in all my heart. Scripture says if you're going to do the works of God, this is it. Believe on His Son whom He has sent. The greatest honor you can give God is to believe Him every step of the way. Everything He says, even in parts we don't like, even in the midst of losing our, our brother, we give you honor because of all the promised rewards our brother's enjoying. PowerPoint's not failing him now. <laughs> He's not forgetting a, a verse or two in the middle of it. It's perfect. It's good. From the rising of the sun to its going down, my name shall be great among the uh, Gentiles. In every place, incense should be offered to my name. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 verses 12 through 17 says this, that we carry, bear, uplift the fragrance of Christ to God. And amongst all the men. So that we smell like Jesus Christ to the living and to the dying. To those who are living, it's a rejoicing, it's a thanksgiving, it's a praise. To those who are dying, it's a hateful smell. They reject it. And that's why some people throw rocks at us and some people bind our wounds. That's why some people were glad when they go and others we, we were broken hearted. But we are the fragrance of Christ. He says here, he says, in every place incense shall be offered. There's no other incense than the incense of Jesus Christ being lifted up in every location, every thought, every action, every activity, everything we say and do at all times. And God forgive me for the times I've failed it. When I've smelled like the world. Or at very least like I've stepped in something. He says, and an incense shall be offered to my name in a and a pure offering, which goes back to what we started with, don't put defiled food on the altar. Check yourself. Check your heart. Don't be sad, guys. Christ has done this for us, and if you're in Him, you, your heart is clean. Your offering is pure. It is acceptable. You leave here 
like the bouquet of Jesus Christ. Smelling good. Smelling refreshed. In making His name great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. That's what He expects from His people. I'm a father. I'm a master. Give me my honor, is what He's saying to us today. And He has given His Son so that you and I have what we need to make an acceptable offering so that we can be received. That's the good news here. Because apart from him, I'm still Esau. Apart from him, I'm a, my, there is no honor, there is no reverence, and everything I do is defiled and evil. But praise be to Jesus Christ who delivers me from this body of death. Let's rejoice in who we have today. Let's rejoice. Let's be obedient by showing honor to our Lord. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I've come to you thanking you for this time with your people. It's been a blessing, Father. I feel refreshed. I hope they are. I thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus, that He always and continually provided perfect honor to you. Always and continually complete reverence. And I thank you that He has anointed us with Himself so that we can offer a fragrance of Christ to you so that we can walk in you and be accepted in the beloved, so that we can give you honor and give you reverence that you're due. Father, forgive us where we, we just walked in the flesh, walked in our weaknesses, and did not put our minds on you. Again, Father, we think of those who have lost loved ones this weekend. We have lost loved ones this weekend, Lord. But the good news is, just what we've read, your son has completely honored you, and because of that, we can approach, and we will be comforted. We will be encouraged. We give you the praise now in Jesus' name for all of this. Amen. Amen.